I, I know I've heard you say that your biggest accomplishment in sport is winning the Mississauga Golf Champion Club Championship, okay? <laughs> a, a few years ago, and I'm just not buying it, okay? Maybe that just can't be the truth. So, back in 1972, as a, as a 12 year old uh, you know, kid who liked hockey, I re remember my dad was quite excited, and some of our friends about this hockey series that was, was coming on between the Soviet Union and Team Canada. And I asked my father, I said, Dad, what, what's, what's so important about this? What's the significance of this? And, and Dad said to me, Lori, it's communism against the free market. <laughs> and as a 12-year-old boy, I didn't know what that meant. Right? It's just I knew it was pretty important, okay? So, anyways, now in that eight-game series, uh, Henny, you scored seven goals. But what I really want you to talk about is that garbage goal you got in that last game. <laughs> And as Rob said, it, it was voted as Canada's uh, sports moment of the century. So, Henny, I really want you to talk about that goal and your spiritual journey because all of us are, are very interested in it. Well, thank you. And, and I'm not, at my age, I need to go to the platform that's something to lean on, okay? <laughs> <laughs> How many of you saw the game? Oh. Gosh, that's a lot more than I ever thought it would be. <laughs> but I got to tell you that uh, I had three big surprises in my life the last two minutes of that game. And I want to tell you about them. And just to back it up, as we said, we were playing eight games. Uh, and after seven games, we were tied three wins each and uh, one tie. And uh, the last game, and I remember saying to Eleanor, if we don't win this series, we're going to be known as the biggest losers in the history of Canadian hockey. <laughs> and we felt that. We get into the last game, and we're losing 5-3 after the second period. And then our leader, on and off on the ice, Phil Esposito, scored a goal the first shift of the third period to make it 5-4. And then at the 12-minute mark, Yvonne Cornway, the run run, the road runner from Montreal, scored to make it 5-5. And then the Russians came down and informed us that if the game ended up in a tie, they were going to claim victory because they had scored one more goal than we had at this point, which was a big, well, a minor surprise. But anyway, the game went on, and with about a minute and 40 seconds left in the game, Ronnie Ellis, Bobby Clark, and myself were aligned. In fact, we were the only line that played all eight games. And we come off the ice with about a minute and 40 seconds left. And I figured, you know, if the game's over for me, and Harry Simeon sent out Phil Esposito, Vaughn Cornway and Peter Mahalovich, and I thought that's a great three to finish off the game. But the, the thing that surprised me, the next lineup was Rod Gilbert, uh, Jean Cronovo, and Dennis Hall. And, uh, you know, for sure, we're not going to get back. But then for some reason, Harry Simon came down after about 15 seconds and said, if there's any time left, you guys take it. There was a little less than a minute left. I was sitting there and I did something. I didn't think about it whatsoever. I, and maybe because I'd scored the winning goal in games six and seven. I got up and I started yelling at Peter Mahovlich, the left winger. And I looked back, where did I ever get that confidence or audacity to do that? And if I'd have been Phil Esposito or Mike Gardner, probably people wouldn't have been that surprised, but I was. I just, and I felt I had to get on, on the ice. And I, I can't explain it. It just happened like that. Well, Peter jumped off, and I jumped over the board, and I scored that goal. And when the puck went over the line, I said out loud to myself, Dad would have loved this one. My dad had died four years earlier. He died at age 49 of a stroke. And I had not thought of my father once that I can remember of that series. But you know something? There's something about a father-son relationship. 
And as I thought about it afterwards, you know, if it hadn't been my, for my dad and some advice he, gave, advice he gave me, I would not have been a hockey player. And I'll tell you why. I was playing uh, hockey in, uh, in Hamilton with the Hamilton uh, uh, Red Wings. We were owned by Detroit. And in 1962, we won the Memorial Cup. We put out five teams. We played 25 playoff games after the season. And when that series was over, or that summer was over, I met my wife that I knew that I was going to marry down the road, and and I was I grew up very poor, and I hated I didn't get a pair of skates till I was nine. I got one hockey stick a year, and then I had to do paper or whatever. That, and uh, I was not going to live that way. And so Eleanor and I had a talk, and I said, you know, I think I need to. We're going to be safer if I quit and get a university education. I was a pretty good student, and and we talked it over, and she said, well, Paul, whatever you want to do, I want to be your wife, and so if you think you should quit, uh, uh, that's what we'll do. And so I phoned Detroit, and I told them I was not coming back, and I told them why, but then I knew I had to go and tell my dad. And I was worried about that. My dad was over six feet, and he was the strongest man I ever met. He had a 58 inch chest and he had a, a quick uh, a temper, I'll tell you. And I was a little afraid of going to, but I knew I had to tell him. So I went back to Lucknow and sat my dad down and I told him what I was going to do and why I was going to do it. And my dad looked at me and he says, Paul, he said, no, I can't say that you're making a bad decision. But son, I would think you, this is what concerns me. You've been telling me since you've been five years old that you're going to be an NHL hockey player. And he says, if you don't go on and try to make it, he says, I really believe when you see these players skating on the ice on Saturday night, you're going to say, I wonder if I could have made it. And he said, son, I think it will drive you crazy. Just not knowing. And he said, what I would suggest go back work your buns off the last year and give yourself a year, maybe two years to make the NHL. And if you can't make it, then you can still go and get an education. And I never thought about that. And so I went back and I told Eleanor what dad had said. And she said, Paul, oh, I believe your dad is right. I believe you need to do it and I'll back you up whatever you decide to do. And because of that, I went back Worked my tails off. I scored 49 goals my last year. It was first All-Star. I scored 13 goals more than anybody else and had an 18-year career. And so I would say to you fathers out here today, mothers, there's going to be times in your children's life that they're going to need good advice. And see, my dad knew me so well that he gave me the best advice I probably ever got at that time. And so I've never had that life And so, let me tell you what happened. We get into the game, like I said, and uh, I don't think I, did I tell you about that? I had six concussions, so did I talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we get to the, we went over that, and I you know that, I've done that now. But anyway, it's, it, it's just amazing when you look back over your life. But I'm, I'm going to very quickly, got to, obviously, uh, so the big surprise is that I got on the ice. The big surprise is I did what I did, you know, calling a person off the ice, and then obviously, you know, saying up right to my dad. But I want to tell you about just very, very quickly two other men that really influenced my life. After we come back from, uh, in that series, uh, I was the toast to Canada, and we couldn't go out for dinners, people, it was a joke, and, and, and it was too much too fast. And Eleanor had always protected herself, and, uh, and uh, but the thing is that I had to play for Hero Ballard, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, like, we didn't have a chance of winning the Stanley Cup or anything like that, and, and I was very dis. And I would say to Eleanor, there was something missing in her life. And about two months later, a guy by the name of Mel Stevens, which a lot of you know from Teen Ranch up there, came into my house, knocked, he'd never met me before, knocked on my door, and long story short, to get into a, a talk, and uh, he talked about 
the spirituality. And uh, he talked about knowing the Lord. And I said, I don't talk about religion, and I don't talk about politics. You just get into an argument. And I said, I've tried to read the Bible, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And he said, Paul, if you want to, I will help you understand the Bible. And for the next two years, Mel Stevens tried to convince me there was a God in heaven that loved me very much and wanted me to get to know him. And I became, we started a Bible study in my house. I am still not a Christian at this point. And Eleanor was petrified. She knows I do everything well or with, you know, I'm in or I'm up. And she was petrified that if I become a Christian, we'll give all our money away and go to live in Africa in a tent or something. And she was pretty cold to her him. But anyway, March 12, 1975, Mel got me. I used to get up in the morning and I'd pray and read the Bible. And this day, I wasn't planning on it, but I was there and I said, Lord, there's much I don't know about you, but I am fully convinced that you love me. I'm fully convinced that you died in my place. And I know that I've got a lot of things that I need forgiveness from. And so I ask you to forgive me and I want you to come into my life and make me the man that you want me to be. And in the same breath, just like that, I said, don't you ever expect me to tell anybody about this because I'm going to be a secret service Christian. And so help me. It took me three days before I had enough courage to even tell him now. And then I knew I had to tell Eleanor. And so I sat her down at the kitchen table. By this time, we'd been married for 10, at least 10 years probably. And uh, we're sitting there, and honestly, my armpits were soaked. And my heart was pounding. And I said to her, Nora, I've become a Christian. <laughs> And she said, oh, wonderful, and got up and walked out. <laughs> Honest to God. But you know, about three months later, she came to me and she said, you know, Paul, something's happened on the inside. We used to go to bed and you tossed and turned, and I always went to sleep before you. You go to bed now, and you fall asleep. And I thought you were faking it for a while. I get up and I'm gonna, and you sleep in And then she said, you used to read a book. And you're fine for about 15 minutes. And then you're always so restless. You had to go and do something else. You sit down and you can read a book for an hour. Something has happened. And thank goodness I had Belle there. We got her a Bible. And about a month later, she gave her life to the Lord. We sent our oldest daughter, Heather, to Teen Ranch that summer. And she came home. and told us that she had given her life to the Lord and then the three of us shared with uh, her two younger sisters and the youngest one is uh, right down here at this table today and uh, and the whole Paul Henderson family became Christians and uh, Mel set the set the, uh, Mel set the, 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 the foundation for it but in 76 because I got had to get away from Harold Ballard. We went to Birmingham, Alabama, and I got down there, and I got into a men's group with a very wise, successful business owner. And we met for three years, from 6.30 6 till 8 o'clock, every Monday morning. And this guy was a businessman, but he modeled for me what it was to be a husband, a father, a friend memorize scripture and I would go to lunch with him and one day he came and he said to us guys you need to write a purpose statement for yourself I suggested go to the end of your life and what do you want your wife to be truthfully able to say what kind of a husband were you what would you want your children to be able to say and if you have grandchildren think about that also what would you want your friends to think about and he said, think about the character qualities that you want to develop. And you know, I worked on that for about three or four months and talked to John about it. And I wrote a purpose statement for myself from 1978, and it hasn't changed since. And so the bottom line is that, uh, well, the bottom line is, I'm running out of time here. 
I journal. I get up in the morning, I spend time in the morning, and I journal. And most mornings I finish off, it, but this is what I want to do for the day. I want to love Jesus with my heart, soul, and mind. I want to try to live like Jesus, and I want to continually learn from Jesus. And the last thing I do, I want to use my life to lead others to Jesus. And you know, that's why all of us are here today. So I would encourage you, just slow down a little bit, and maybe you need also some answers. And we've got a ministry called Leader Impact and a bunch of other things, and we can get good advice to you. God bless you, and have a great day.